please a warm welcome for Aldat Hoffman. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning to you all. I hope the, the mic is on. I'm, I think there over there will be the talk timer. That's excellent. Uh, for a moment this morning when I entered this beautiful room, I was afraid or I had the hope that we could present from over here. <coughs> At least my mother was always willing, uh, had the wish that I would be over there, but uh, unfortunately uh, she cannot witness this anymore. Um, last April, um, our CIO, Stuart Bloom, he is the CEO of Schiphol Airport, uh, won the trophy of being the most innovative airport in Europe. Not in the world, but at least in Europe. So while we we're all still celebrating that, the month of May started, and in May, with spring holidays, our <coughs> waiting times and the queues for security and the queues for the border control hit the roof. We hit the news, we were on television, uh, all people were complaining, so within the company everybody was asking, okay, what's going on? We are the most innovative airport, on the other hand, people have to wait far more than we anticipate or than we planned. And dare hardly ask, but uh, uh, probably a lot of you entered the Netherlands through Schiphol, either today or yesterday or the day before, and probably you have had some trouble with the queues entering the country. If so, apologies on the company, but it's part of life. So that's, that's why we started. Um, as Steve said, I'm trying to lead the enterprise architects at uh, Schiphol. Uh, we have a group of about uh, 10 people and we uh, did some experience on the digital transformation program that we had in the past few uh, years. So from Schiphol we have over 320 direct connections where you can go from, uh, from our airport. We have about 40% of all passengers that go through Schiphol uh, do have a transfer at Schiphol and about 40% of all uh, uh, passengers travel by public transport. Well, so far so good and then the numbers in the middle illustrate that there's a huge growth in the number of passengers and that's above industry average and that causes some pain because especially what you see in the middle, it's, it's difficult to point out, but in the middle you see the, let's see, the 75.5, that's the on-time performance. And the on-time performance in 2013 was about 82%. The on-time performance last year was 75%. And the on-time performance means the performance of all airlines in flights leaving on time as scheduled. If that percentage drops, we're not happy, airlines are not happy, passengers are not happy. So that's one of the reasons why we said in the past few years, okay, we have to take action. Our usual way of reacting is building, building more concrete, making more buildings, making more departure halls whatsoever, but we ran out of space. Amsterdam Airport Schiphol is it's a, quite a large airport, but we are, we cannot um, uh, occupy the, country, the, the countryside around the airport, that's all strictly re uh, regulated. So the decrease in punctuality was an important reason for us to come into action. Another thing is, this is a picture of what you see during morning rush hour. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, when a lot of uh, people head up in the departure hall. and. It also illustrates the difficulties that we have as an, as an airport because the left part is the responsibility of the airport. That's about the flow of the passengers through the terminal. Then you see in the middle there's the blue line. These are the check-in kiosks and that's the responsibility of the airline. Behind the uh, check-in kiosk you have the backdrop responsibility of the airline. In Amsterdam you go upstairs and upstairs you have the security control. That's a responsibility of the airport. And after that if you travel international you have border police, border control. That's a responsibility of the government. So that's why you 
hopefully start to see how, it, how difficult it might be to align all these processes through all different organizations with all different stakeholders and of course uh, different um, things to achieve. So these two aspects, decrease in punctuality, the increase of the number of passengers uh, led to a new Disruptive technologies will the change ICT the way department. people travel and how an airport is run. Schiphol ICT wants to lead the way with a seamless passenger journey within a smart run airport. Virtual control room operators know and manage the current airport status. Based on real-time sensors and use of big data, they know how many passengers are coming and can predict future flow and disruption to be able to anticipate and plan resources accordingly. So queues are virtually non-existent. The one-time ID check takes passengers seamlessly through our processes. IDs are not asked for twice. And because Mr. Chen knows how much spare time he has left, he will get his personalized offer. Passengers and airlines are entering the digital world. Boarding call for Schiphol. Are we in? So this is a very interesting uh, video and Im imagine that this one was made by our new CIO. He came in two, two, two and a half years ago. Uh, he, of course, he changed half of the uh, management uh, team and then he came up with this brilliant new vision and when we as the architects saw that vision for the very first time we said, okay, well, looks excellent, but how are you going to do that? Uh, because uh, do you know what's going on and what the difficulties are in realizing the things that you, that you envision? So, back from a beautiful video to just architecture, just Archimate and just some boring PowerPoints. But that's what we needed to, to make sure and to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, make it um, visible what we needed or what we need to realize that beautiful vision that we're still working on. So two strategic goals. Provide a seamless passenger journey for all passengers and enable cost-efficient operations for the airlines. So what you see in the, in the picture that we see the most important thing from the perspective of the passenger, on the other side, the most important thing from the perspective of the airline. And in the middle is what we like to gain with uh, having these goals realized in, uh, for our own airport. So based on this, and there's another important thing, is that we prefer to use open data or provide open data. Uh, in the airport, we think that it's much more uh, beneficial that everybody uses our data than that all kind of people uh, try to make up their own data. So we want to provide data wherever possible and of course within regulations wherever allowed. So based on the video based on these strategic goals we worked out a program and based around an architecture vision and this I had some doubts whether or not to include this this slide because it can be quite complicated but the main thing is that from the perspective of the passenger you start at the top and we say okay we want to provide you personal and relevant information and on the bottom side, within airport control, that's where we want to control our airport and make sure that everything runs as smoothly as possible. In an airport, planning a day ahead is not difficult, because then everything is still according to schedule. <laughs> that's true. The tough part starts on the day itself. And that's what Steve mentioned uh, this morning, my plan was to come over here by train, the schedule was excellent, the, I had plenty of time, and then the train hit a deer before it entered the station where I was going to uh, uh, park.
part on that train. So we had a delay of about 10 minutes, and that's what happens during the day. And these operational, let's say, deviations, operational circumstances make it very difficult to uh, live up to the schedule in an airport. So what we want to do, and that's what you see in the, in the bullets, we want to monitor what's going on in reality. And we can monitor through uh, all kinds of devices, all kinds of sensors, or all kinds of, uh, let's say, standard uh, assets that are available in the airport. And by using that data, we can do a lot of things. We can uh, use it to calculate our capacity. We can use it to find out and plan if flights, aircrafts, passengers, baggage will be in time in the right place to have a departure in time. And we can monitor if things go as they should go. And in the end, we know, just by statistics, that things will go wrong. Um, people will forget somewhere a piece of their luggage. Unfortunately, we know by statistics that people do have a heart attack in the airport. We don't like that, but that's, that's life. It happens, so we have to deal with it. So we have a, an approach from two sides. We want to collect data from real life, monitor what's going on in the airport, use it to provide passengers with excellent info, as personal as possible and as personal as people want to. So there's, of course, the consent. You have to agree that we use it and that we provide that info to you. And in the bottom end, we use it to control what's going on in the airport. So that's where we build our architecture. Uh, that's what the architecture vision is, and that's where we build our architecture upon. So we went from that vision in a couple of, let's say, I guess, two months or so with people from business and people from IT and say, okay, what kind of services do you need? And what kind of products do you, do you need? How do we think that that can be realized? Um, what are the application components that you foresee? Which functionality should be in which component? And bit by bit, we came up to an entire application architecture. The interesting thing is that usually there will be, of course, the importance of the business architecture, but this was an IT-driven strategy. So we deliberately said, okay, this is the technology push. This is what you can do. And then we started the discussion with our business areas, business units. Okay, what do you, what do you want? How does this fit in your timeline of operations? So there was a deliberate choice to do it this way. Another interesting thing is that these kind of models we used and still use to depict the scope for epics. Of course, no long, we, do not, we do not longer use waterfall methodology. Um, so we use the value streams and we use the epics and we use this kind of simple models to make sure, okay, this is the scope of your epic. You're gonna realize a specific application service, we deliberately ma uh, made sure that the business service is in place as well, and we depicted what is the goal that you're going to achieve. The business service, we had some models where we left it out. And um, they said, okay, so it's just an IT um, a piece of work. I said, no, remember that the business service has to be in place because you have to adapt your business process. The business change was the most important thing for us to make sure that that was addressed in the business areas. We can do a lot of things from IT, but if the business service is not included in a regular way of working, it just won't work. So that's where we a couple of times failed, and that's where we said, okay, we need these kind of models to make sure how to scope the work of a specific epic. So after all, we had a beautiful application architecture, 
it's of course far too large to explain, so I won't. But in the middle part you see all regular business applications. And on top of that you might see that we have some intelligence applications. That's where we use the smart data and that's where we use the smart process. So if you take all the data and the real-time data that we, uh, that we collect, we use it to adapt our process, that's the smart process part, we uh, adapt the process on the fly wherever possible and we use the smart data to provide the best data and the best information that enables you or the airline to depart in time. And on top of that we have the digital channels where we make sure that whatever data goes out it's just the same amount and the same part of information that will come to the passenger whether the passenger uses our own app, uses the web, or uses an airline app, or uses whatever other digital channel he or she prefers. So that's, <coughs> in as, as a few large components, the things that we use. Well, so far, so good. But then, somebody said, well, we're growing at this kind of significant numbers, uh, that we just need a new departure hall. So hold on with your digital airport program. <laughs> We're going to build a new <laughs> departure hall. By the way, we are going to do that within seven months. And uh, dear IT department, you have one week to find out if it's feasible. And by the way, guess what? There's only one answer accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so the only thing is, how can you do it? So the thing that we that we used, and that's where we that's why we use a, a significant part of all the work that we already did is that what you see in the, let's say the, 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 the lower part of the slide is that we could talk with all these parties to say, okay, what do you need in your departure hall? What do you need for check-in? What do you need for drop-off? What do you need for um, uh, self-service uh, stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And we used the stuff that we already made, we reused it and said, okay, well, these are the products and uh, behind these products you will find these kind of business services, application services and application components. And it saved us a lot of time just by reusing the same stuff. We needed a different view because the guys that really uh, built the terminal, uh, they don't use Archimate. And the guys that really uh, do the construction of the terminal, they don't use Epics. And they don't build a departure hall in sprints of two weeks. They just say, okay, we are going to build a departure hall and we need to know what you need in a couple of years time. Another interesting thing was that uh, from, let's say, uh, from a management perspective, the, oh, the board said, okay, well, if we are going to build a departure hall, we would prefer to make one consortium responsible for realizing the entire departure hall, including all IT. Because that's most easy from the board of direction perspective to control everything. And say, well, then we will end up with a second IT landscape. Wow. <laughs> This is interesting. <laughs> uh, so we said, okay, it's fine if you make some assumptions or make some new statements or new systems in the, in the hall itself, but we need integration with our airport control but because we can not control our airport as one airport if you end up with two sets of application systems. Impossible. So we focused and we made sure that the airport control stuff, which is, I'd say, the most important aspect in making sure that everything runs well, then that they integrate with the stuff that we already have. Airport control was an important aspect in our original digital transformation. Um, we've been working on that for some time uh, by now. Um, we've got a video on the current status. Um, this time the voice over is in Dutch, subtitles are in English.
Bij de eerste testvlucht in 1903 had uitvinder Wilbur Wright al de visie, vliegen wordt voor mensen iets heel normaals en de burgerluchtvaart blijft dan ook groeien. Amsterdam Airport Schiphol is een populaire luchthaven. En binnenkort zullen we 70 miljoen passagiers ontvangen en 500.000 vliegtuigbewegingen. Met de beperkte capaciteit die we hebben is het dus zaak dat we die optimaal benutten. En daarom zijn we het Digital Airport programma gestart. Airport Control binnen dat programma is heel erg belangrijk. Omdat daar gekeken wordt naar passagiersstromen, bagageprocessen en vliegtuigafhandeling. En dat is nodig om onze klanten optimaal te kunnen bedienen. Passagiers gaan door check-in en bagage drop-off via security en paspoortcontrole richting het vliegtuig. Vliegtuigen komen aan, gaan naar de juiste gate en worden klaargemaakt voor de volgende vlucht. Ondertussen moeten ook bagage en overstappende passagiers het juiste vliegtuig bereiken. Airport Control heeft honderden sensoren in de terminal geplaatst. Deze brengen de gecompliceerde passagiersstromen in beeld. Bij Airport Control draait het om grip krijgen op wat er op de terminal gebeurt. We werken samen naar één gezamenlijk doel. En dat is vliegtuigen veilig en op tijd laten vertrekken met passagiers en hun bagage aan boord. Nou, binnen Airport Control zijn we bezig met de ontwikkeling van Wilbur. En Wilbur is vernoemd naar de pionier van de burgerluchtvaart. En net zoals zijn voorganger heeft Wilbur een vooruitziende blik. Zo kunnen we bij de te verwachten capaciteitsproblemen vier uur van tevoren voorspellen wat eraan zit te komen qua situatie. En vervolgens daar actief, proactief regie op voeren. Airport Control is constant bezig met digitale innovaties om de operatie soepel te laten verlopen. Zoals de sensoren binnen de terminal die belangrijke data over passagiersstromen genereren. Dit is weer onmisbare input voor Wilbur, die deze data samenvoegt met informatie uit andere bronnen tot één compleet overzicht. Zo kunnen onze regisseurs tot wel vier uur vooruitkijken en vooraf bijsturen. Kunstmatige intelligentie geeft Wilbur de mogelijkheid om te leren van situaties en helpt ons bij het nemen van de beste beslissingen. Daarnaast kijken we terug met data-analyse. Het combineren van deze elementen is een unieke, vernieuwende manier van werken waarbij we continu optimaliseren. Met Wilbur hebben we de ambitie om onze medewerkers bij Airport Control in staat te stellen beter regie te voeren over de operatie. We hebben vaak te maken met grote vakantiedruktes of operationele verstoringen. Hierbij lopen we het risico dat vluchten op een ander moment vertrekken of aankomen dan dat we in eerste instantie hadden gepland. Nou, om de impact hiervan te beperken combineren wij veel informatie uit veel verschillende systemen. En dit is bijna een onmogelijke taak. Alleen in ons vluchtinformatiesysteem hebben we al meer dan 30.000 wijzigingen per dag. Wilbur filtert de meest relevante wijzigingen en toont wat dit betekent voor het proces. En waar de mogelijke oplossingen liggen. Bijvoorbeeld het effect van een gate change. Hierdoor kunnen de verschillende regisseurs beter met elkaar overleggen en samen maatregelen nemen. Het effect? Vliegtuigen vertrekken veilig en op tijd. Ook bij verstoringen en de toenemende drukte. Airport Control verbetert de operatie met de allerlaatste digitale innovaties. We zijn hard bezig om onze ambitie waar te maken. Kom naar onze DAP-demo's of check de Digital Airport Program Jammer Groep voor de laatste ontwikkelingen. note from the, the, the last uh, remarks, this was an internal video, um, because our dub demos are available for everybody within Schiphol, of course, but if you come along, I'm happy to show you around. Uh, there are a few important things about this, this video. Um, somewhere, uh, the voiceover said, okay, well, we, have to, we can um, foresee or um, uh, four hours in advance. We uh, have to reckon with the things that can change within the four hours departure. Uh, like I said, a day ahead, the planning is excellent. That's, that's not the challenge. The challenge is what happens during the day, and then it, four hours ahead is quite a lot, of, uh, a lot of time. Because sometimes it means that we, even before a plane leaves Amsterdam to London, we already take into account what might happen if the plane already in, uh, gets a delay either in Amsterdam or in London and then when it returns in four hours time. So that's, that's where the difficulty um, is. Uh, another important thing is what the said what we use with um, artificial intelligence and or uh, big data. Um, a lot of things um, 
work just as normal. So we have the regular processes. We also have the irregular processes, and that's uh, things like de-icing. So it doesn't happen every day, but when it happens, we know what to do, and it's just a regular way of working. And then there's the, the real disturbance. And that's the thing where we say, okay, how did we solve that issue last year? And with, let's say, over 500 or about 500,000 flight movements a year, we just don't remember how we solved that issue last year. And that's where we use, um, uh, let's say, tools like Watson to find out, okay, what did we do last year in the same circumstances and how did we solve that situation? So that's where we use uh, this uh, stuff. Um, another important thing is uh, the seamless flow. Uh, seamless flow is quite important for us because it, it really helps the passenger and uh, you do not have to show your documents in every place in the airport. Uh, but the things that have to be controlled or checked behind the scenes, behind the screens during the process are quite uh, complex. So we do have some proof of concepts. Um, if you happen to be at the airport uh, later this week, at gay, gate F6, Foxtrot uh, 6, there we have a proof of concept on biometric boarding. So you can board the airport um, just by uh, having your face recognized from a previous registration. Um, previous in the way minutes or half an hour or an hour before. We do not collect all those biometric data, we just use it once and when the plane has left we swap all the data. The other thing that we do is the proof of concept on a biometric border. Um, that's at the transfer uh, passage because then you have to check the data with the systems of the, uh, the let's say the Dutch government. Are you allowed to pass the board? Uh, another interesting thing is what the way we work. Um, the guy over here, that's one of my colleagues. So we, uh, the company encourages us and our IT department encourages us, go and help in operations. During summer peaks, don't stay at your desk, go into the terminal, help people, see what's going on, see what the problems are, see what kind of questions people struggle with, and that gives you the best input to find out where you can improve your systems. Um, so that's the thing that we really, uh, really like. From the strategic goals that we started with a couple of years ago with the seamless passenger journey and the smart run airport, um, we started some value streams uh, with airport control, the personal relevant information, seamless flow. Uh, the thing I want that I would like to mention with this slide is how we are involved from the enterprise architecture perspective. So we have the overall portfolio management, that's the overall portfolio management of the entire program. Um, that's where I'm uh, participating. So as the lead enterprise architect, I participate in the program portfolio management team. In the value streams, uh, let's say my enterprise architect for that specific uh, domain, let's say passenger services or airport services, one of the ar enterprise architects participates in the portfolio team within the value stream. Within the value stream, you have a, a number of delivery teams, and that's where, where our solution architects are. Apart from the this program, we have traditional project and we have other projects as well. So the enterprise architects overview all kind of initiatives that will change our IT and they participate in the portfolio teams. In the delivery teams, we have the solution architects. So that's how we organize and make sure that we are involved in all important uh, changes that will happen in the upcoming years. In the end, <coughs> this program will end probably at the end of next year. But of course, that does not mean that the digital transformation is finished by then, nor does it mean um, uh, that <laughs> we will have achieved our goals, bec because these goals go on and on and on. A very important step that we still have to take, and that's not only a thing that we can do, but where we need the entire industry,
country is to go from an airport where we where we automate and digitalize the traditional processes and we have to make the step to a really digital setup of processes and as a very simple example what we have right now is that the the, the, the officers who are out in the field and um, make sure that the birds uh, stay out of the area of the of the planes, they use the tablet to write down which birds they see, where they see them, uh, the, the, um, the amount they see, etc. etc. Nobody thinks yet about just making a picture of the birds starting automatic registration. That's the next step. So right now, it's still, in a lot of si situations, it's automating traditional processes, digitalizing traditional processes, and the next step, but that will take years, is to, as an industry, airport industry, um, make sure that we go into digitalized setup of processes. So that's what we will we'll do the upcoming years. Um, that finishes my talk as well. So in our seamless journey, we're taking steps if you have the ability to check at the airport next week, do try and uh, visit the proof of concept uh, locations. In the airport control, a lot of things happen that you don't see because they're literally taking place in the rooms where they direct the traffic and control the flows. So that's it from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ola. If you could uh, take a seat yeah. over here, we've uh, you've triggered quite a few questions from the audience, which is great that they've uh, found what you've uh, been talking about uh, interesting, and they figured out how to use Slido. So two good <laughs> reasons. <laughs> so, so a few a few here. The first first one that came in was you you described this um, this program as being um, driven from the IT department. Given that, how did you get buy-in from the business side, this common thing between business and IT, so <coughs> how, how, did that, how did you get the buy-in was the question. Um, the interesting thing was what happened, let's say, um, uh, uh, one or two years uh, before this situation happened. And you remember uh, Google Glass, and from the IT perspective, from the IT department, we saw a lot of possibilities where we could use that. But we could not convince business departments that it was that important that they had to uh, skip other projects. So right now, we were in a situation where we had our own funding and where we could say, okay, colleagues from the business, we are going to use Google Glass or whatever. And by the way, you don't have to skip projects. You don't have to bring the money. We have the possibility to help you on top of your regular way of working. And that gave the buy-in. Okay. All right. Um, is enterprise architecture institutionalized within the organization? Uh, and what, uh, what, is, what is its uh, ongoing terms of reference? Uh, institution. What does that mean? That's an interesting thing. Well, the, the most important thing is um, because then I'd say it, it's not institutionalized yet. The most important thing is that with the, with the, the new CIO, uh, he said to me, "Okay, well, you're the lead architect. I want you to provide services to all business areas, to all business departments, and you have to be involved in all changes that go on." Up till then, we just focused on some of the most strategic projects. So by now, we make sure that we are involved in everything that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I say, like a lot of other organizations, we're still struggling because we work by model. We work in the agile way of working. We work in a traditional way of working. We have these huge construction programs. So we have to adapt our way of working. We do not use one single way of working. Sounds like it's on the way to being institutionalized if it isn't already, though, if you're operating across every, you know, every yeah. important project. If institutionalized means bureaucratic. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope not. We hope not. Um, 
do you collaborate with other European airport authorities for best practices, particularly Spanish airports? Spanish? Oh, that's... <laughs> Um, well, f f first of all, we we do um, let's we do cooperate as an ecosystem, of course, with the airlines and air traffic control in Amsterdam. These are by far the most important partners uh, for us. Um, within Europe, a lot of airports work closely together. Uh, we share not only we share data, we share knowledge, we share experience with with all kind of uh, projects, because the difficulty is not in picking a product, the difficulty is making it work in the specific geographic situation where you're in. Um, I'd like to have more cooperation with Spanish airports, but right now it's not very uh, uh, specific. Well, well, right, okay. Um, let's see, there was a question here about uh, AI. Um, you talked about uh, using Watson for, or the, the video I think talked about yeah. using Watson for um, analyzing some of the data that was coming yeah. in after. Um, uh, the, the question here is, what are you, uh, what technologies, do, well, are you trying to predict things using AI? And if so, what technologies are in play there? Ooh, um, I think I have to skip the part on the technology, but the things that we like to predict, of, uh, one of the most important things is predictive maintenance, mm -hmm. but that, that's quite familiar with a lot of organizations. And the next one is, uh, can we predict uh, waiting times? And that's a very sp specific and a, sp a very uh, tough uh, topic. So if you, if you enter the queue right now, or if you enter the building right now, what will be your waiting time at security in half an hour time? And if we can predict that, then we can give exact advice to people, okay, you'd better come in 50 minutes earlier or later, and then the there will hardly be no queue. So I'm going yeah. to Disneyland. Yeah. Yeah. Predict, That's predict the, the length <laughs> of the queue. Yeah. Yeah. One of the yeah. things that Disneyland has that they have specific attractions with the spe sp specific capacity of the attraction mm. and the specific amount of seconds that the attraction will take. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. We don't have that. Um, how do you combine EA and Agile, and what are the what are the challenges? Um, I think that um, we've, we've, we much more focus on the, on the result. Um, we do not do uh, documents anymore unless that is specifically requested by a specific project in case of tenders, etc., etc. And otherwise, we, we participate in the teams, we use the models to illustrate and to discuss uh, with the teams how, how things will evolve. And, and for instance, the, the Wilbur system that was mentioned, it is built uh, in an agile way of working, every two weeks new additions in, in epics, and that's, well, I, the architect working in that team is hardly ever, in, let's say, in my department, he's always participating in the team. Okay, um, we are, uh, I'll just take a couple more uh, quick question. Well, I hope they're quick. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, a timely one uh, about sensors. We've just, the Open Group has just launched a new group uh, about working on uh, sensor, sensor open system architecture. Um, so are, the st are all the sensors from one vendor or manufacturer and how many sensor APIs are there? Have you learned about metadata with many heterogeneous sensors that you can help us understand? At least one of those questions affect one of those. Are they, do you use one vendor or do you? I'll, ju I'll just put it the other way around because of, of course um, uh, Internet of Things is a very important topic for us as well. Um, if you think that in the ecosystem of the airport uh, with land site, with the terminal, um, with the, uh, the air site where the planes are, with all the assets that are taking place in there, uh, with all the airlines, with the cargo um, uh, suppliers, etc. If you think that within that entire ecosystem we will have one IoT system with sensors or one vendor, please think again. Mm -hmm. There will be a um, heterogeneous landscape of all kinds of vendors and that's where we participate. 
or that's well, what we foresee. So we need to work together and interoperate. And, uh, yeah, so open, 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 open as yeah. well. Can't finish, find a better word to uh, stop on that, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to quit there. So that, that's wonderful. Elder, thank you very much. Thank for you. Your, uh, You're welcome.